Hello, my name is Fayette Williams and I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon with a practice heavily built on jaw reconstruction, especially with dental implants. I direct a fellowship in head and neck oncology uh, in addition to having surgical residents and training rotating with me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Texas and these are a few of my residents and fellows in training that work with me. So this is the basic outline uh, we'll go over today and the idea here is that uh, I, I think many dental implant concepts are not fully understood by the engineers and at the same time we're seeing increasing numbers of fibulas um, uh, wanting immediate implants and then many of the surgeons haven't done this before and will re rely on the engineers to make suggestions uh, about how to develop these cases and then finally it, it would be useful if um, if the processes were uniform among the engineers. Um, one of the uh, first things, this is an important concept to get out of the way up front. When you hear us say the word implant, we're not talking about teeth. We're talking about anchors that go into the bone which allow the teeth to be attached to them. And don't call them posts because the then the surgeons will think you don't don't know what you're talking about. And uh, if you if you hear the surgeons call them posts, and the surgeon probably doesn't know what they're talking about either. So we'll go through the dental implant concepts here. Um, you know much of this already if you do orthognathic surgery planning. Uh, teeth are not lined up end to end to occlude with only one opposing tooth. They are offset to actually occlude with two opposing teeth. So if we look at this again in the sagittal plane, the teeth are not perfectly aligned because the cusps interdigitate with the opposing cusps. And so if we superimpose implants over these teeth, we see that the lower implants emerging through the center of the lower teeth should align with the palatal cusp of the upper teeth, not the center of the upper teeth. So this knowledge allows us to position mandibular implants and fibulas in cases where we don't have mandibular teeth as a reference. Uh, just point the implants to the palatal cusps of the upper teeth. Now for implants in maxillary fibulas, the same principles that apply as you can see on the right. A maxillary implant should point towards the buccal cusp of the lower teeth. So um, another concept that's important is restorative space. And this is defined as the vertical distance from the platform of the implant to the incisal edge of the teeth. And the platform is the, the top of the implant. Uh, in dental prosthetics, this restorative space um, is made up of several components. Uh, I, I think of these components as the white the pink and metal. So it's like tooth, gums, and a substructure framework that's created. This picture shows 18 millimeters as the vertical restorative space. Uh, the minimum should be 15 millimeters. So because the fibulas usually have skin from the leg covering them, we're not able to have pink gums around the teeth. So it's more cosmetic to build the pink gums into the prosthesis. This is one of the reasons that for a, let's say, 10 millimeter tall tooth, we need 15 millimeters or more of vertical space. So as seen as the, uh, on this top photo, inadequate vertical restorative space doesn't allow us to add in the pink and it's not very cosmetic because it ends up being a bunch of piano keys. So there, there's a metal bar on the inside for strength purposes on the final prosthesis, but not on the, the final prosthesis they get at the time of surgery. Uh, the final prosthesis is made about three months later once we verify the implants have integrated or fused with the bone. Uh, we don't want to waste money on the final teeth until we know that the implants are solid and that takes a minimum of, of three months and so th th this bottom prosthesis is um, uh, the, the way that most of these are, are, are built um, and this picture just shows 15 millimeters of vertical space to give us an idea of how far from the incisal edge of the teeth the, the fibula needs to be and this is so that we have space to create the tooth the white portion and the pink gum portion in the prosthesis offset uh, in the dental implant world offset refers to the distance from the platform of the implant which is the top of the implant to the top of the guide tube in, in the cut in a uh, fibula cutting guide for the drills uh, this is the guide tube in the fibula cutting guide. And this picture is defined by the green arrow. 
so for the, uh, the the offset distance that I use for Nobel BioCare implant brand is nine millimeters, and uh, more on this later. Uh, most guided dental implant systems, and by the way, if you're going to do these cases, the surgeons have to use a guided system. So most of these systems use inserts, which they refer to as keys, to drill the holes. Because implants are much wider than the screws used for reconstruction plates, a small pilot hole is drilled first, then wider drills are used to widen the holes. So if the largest drill was used up front, and as the only drill, it would overheat the bone and damage it. So we start with a small hole and then enlarge the diameter of the hole with a series of wider drills. These keys are made as inserts to go in the holes in the surgical guide. Now, the, the inner diameter of each key changes for each larger drill size, but the outer diameter of each key remains the same so that each key can fit inside the hole in the surgical guide. And so this is a, a video excerpt uh, I sped up to show the guided key concept. And this is from BioHorizons, which is a dental implant manufacturer. And the example here is this is actually, this is not a fibula case. This is just a regular dental implant case, which would be done in the office. And, and so each of these keys has the same outer diameter. And you get the idea how each key fits into this hole. And uh, but, but the inner diameter allows successively larger drills to be used. Um, and again, this photo shows the basic parts, but remember, don't refer to an implant as a post. Now, if we're replacing a single tooth, which is never the case with a fibula, then the implant can be thought of as an artificial root. But if we're, if, if we're replacing multiple teeth, which is the case with most fibulas, we just place a few implants and construct a bridge of teeth to span across the implants. These metal pieces embedded in the teeth are like hollow chimneys that extend up through the occlusal surface of the teeth and serve as screw access channels. The teeth have tiny screws to fixate them to the implants. And I'll show this better in, in just a minute. Also, um, very quickly, osseointegration is why implants work. Uh, implants don't work because they're screws. They work because they're made of a type of metal with a surface coating that allows your bone to fuse and biologically attach. And this process takes about three months. Um, the, re the reason this is important is, is that not all the bone that fuses to the implant will stay healthy and attached to the implant. Research tells us that one to two millimeters of bone at the platform of the implant which is the, the, the top of the bone, will be lost due to inflammation and periodontal disease within the first one to two years. Uh, and so this, is, uh, so this is why the platform or the top of the implant should be placed one to two millimeters deep to the crest of the bone to compensate for this expected bone loss. If the implant becomes exposed, they get colonized with oral bacteria and it starts a downward spiral of continued bone loss until the implant actually gets loose and falls out. Uh, this is a dental x-ray in a regular mandible where you can see how the threads are no longer buried in bone due to uh, bone loss around the implants. Uh, by the way, this dental implant phenomenon holds true for all implants, not just in, in fibulas. And so the take home point here is uh, uh, I, I think beginner surgeons will place the implants uh, just at the crest of the bone, but they actually need to be placed one to two millimeters deep. And I'll show you a way to uh, uh, plan that easily um, coming up here. So uh, for, for a few pearls in the virtual surgical planning here, we'll go over uh, with, with the jaw resection. Uh, now, this is largely out of the engineer's decision, but some surgeons try to cut between the teeth to save the next tooth. It's better to just sacrifice that next tooth and cut through the socket. The reason it's a problem to cut between teeth is that it leaves very minimal bone on the next remaining tooth. Within about a year, this bone melts away and the gums recede, leaving a loose tooth, which has to be removed later. So this is why I go ahead and sacrifice that tooth now to avoid the, the problem later. Um, also, uh, you know, everybody has their preference. I like, the reason I like to join the two guides together as one piece is because um, uh, sometimes it can be hard to find what I call the happy spot where this fits on the mandible because it's not visual as much as it's a feel, to feel where it kind of locks in. So having 
both pieces joined together makes it uh, uh, more three-dimensionally complex and the more three-dimensionally complex you can make this the fewer wrong positions it's going to fall in um, fibula orientation and position the the lateral surface is the buccal plate um, so implants uh, implants should emerge through the anterior surface of the fibula not the posterior surface now there, 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 there are lots of surgeons out there who have implants emerge through the posterior uh, the, the the reason that uh, uh, I think it's best to have them emerge through the anterior surface is because it, it the skin paddle and, and the perforators to the skin paddle are coming from below from the, from the posterior surface and, and the skin paddle can wrap up over the buckle to give a soft tissue vestibule which which separates the cheek from the um, uh, the, the, the tongue area and uh, I have an example I'll show you of, of that real, real soon um, a lot of people don't like implants on the anterior surface of the fibula because that's where you tend to have this kind of thin knife edge ridge and, and it can make it more difficult uh, to place them there um, also in fibula position um, the post in the posterior mandible uh, the, the fibula should be kept, kept low just to maintain that restorative space because the mouth opening is more narrow in the back. Um, as you come anteriorly, um, I, I, I like raising the fibula up off the inferior border um, so that we can have a smooth 15 millimeters or so of restorative space all the way across. Um, sometimes I'll set the chin backwards a little bit, which, which can help... Uh, lengthen that chin segment uh, as far as the double barrel goes I'm not a fan of the double barrel and the reason is that it usually comes at the expense of restorative space so it forces you to encroach on that 15 millimeters and and, and there can actually be not enough room to place teeth in there um, and so what I, what I tell surgeons is double barrel if you want to but not at the expense of the restorative space um, and uh, again we've talked about these uh, these things here these are just just some examples of uh, on, on the left how um, you know if, if you put the fibula at the inferior border like this uh, it's very difficult and sometimes impossible to have successful dental implants uh, placed in there mainly because of the the soft tissue because you can't keep the cheek off of these implants and that's why the photos on the right is um, what I prefer to, to, to raise the, the, the fibula up as you move anteriorly. Um, you know, the pro problem with the fibula is that it's a, it's a small bone. And so on the left, this, this is the x-ray, which shows a vertical problem where when the, when the bone is placed very low, um, you know, this is a mile high prosthesis uh, that, you know, the space has to be filled with these teeth which, which is a prosthetic uh, difficulty here and there's some strength problems where these tend to fracture and uh, and over on the right this this is the animation I created to show how as you move posteriorly in the mandible the the inferior border stays wide but the teeth move more lingual so the further posterior you go in the mandible uh, the, the the further the teeth do not necessarily line up directly uh, over the bone. This is a animation I created to uh, give an idea, just just the visual concept of how the implants should, um, I think, emerge from the anterior surface of the, the fibula, and the lateral surface of the fibula is the buccal plate of the jaw, which is where the reconstruction plate will will go. And of course, if you flip this around. Uh, to use the opposite leg, still with the implants coming from the anterior, you can see that the, the pedicle now emerges from the posterior, uh, whereas the previous animation had, it, had the pedicle emerging from the anterior. So what's the big deal with, with this? Well, on the left is this animation that shows one of my cases where the skin paddle, and this is about four months later after healing, so the skin paddle from below rotates up over the buckle, and because it's coming from below, it, it it's, it's sutured in place under slight tension, 
which creates this vestibule and the vestibule is, is this space it's like this sulcus or this this ditch um, between the cheek and lip tissue and the implants now these other photos on the right are examples of impl implants uh, coming out the posterior surface of the fibula which means the skin paddle is sitting directly on top of the implants like a pillow and in this bottom photo, you can see how, how bulky this is, where they've had to go back and uh, make incisions and dig through all this skin and subcutaneous fat to try to find the implants. And so the, the, the reason that I think implants are best placed emerging from the anterior surface is not for bone reasons, but it's for soft tissue reasons. Um, so... I, I've created this uh, virtual implant. We call it a, a VSP implant. And this is, um, uh, it, it's basically the most common implant I use, which is 3.75 millimeters in diameter and 13 millimeters in length. The length doesn't matter so, so much. If these things stick out the inferior border of the fibula, that's okay. And um, you, know, you can still plant it with a 13 millimeter long implant. And if the surgeon sees that, hey, these are really sticking out a lot, then, then they know that they just pull out a 10 millimeter or shorter implant uh, in, instead. And so the, um, with, with this VSP implant, there, there are several features here I'll, I'll go over with you, with, with you that, that allow us to uh, really um, improve on our accuracy in, in these plans um, and so as some general rules of thumb we want the, we want the implant to angulate through the occlusal surface of the teeth um, and if there's no pre-existing teeth use the opposing teeth as a reference which is this photo at the bottom which we already talked about uh, before uh, the the edge of the implant should be about you know a minimum of three millimeters from the cut edge of the fibula um, now there's no science behind this and nobody really knows how close you can get but this is the number i've used uh for dozens of cases and i, I haven't found a problem with this yet um, implants don't have to be parallel uh, it's easier a little bit if they are but not terribly easier um, and also uh, this this six millimeter diameter brown abutment here uh, is not the size of the guided hole in the fibula cutting guide. And that's really important to, to know that the, the guide hole in the fibula cutting guide is based on the implant manufacturer's keys, those inserts, not on um, this uh, tall cylinder here. This, um, uh, let's see, and, and this is a file uh, I've actually made this available to um, uh, most of the vendors and I've also uploaded it onto Thingiverse which is an STL file repository and it's posted under the Creative Commons licenses so it's, it's, it's free for anyone to, to, to download and, and, and use here. Um, now the um, so bear with me on this slide because this is probably the most painful and tedious slide. Here's the purpose for the six millimeter virtual abutment cylinder. The actual cylinder that is placed is 3.5 millimeters wide. We need a hole in the teeth or in the prosthesis for this 3.5 millimeter cylinder to extend into the teeth. Then we inject acrylic, which is like dental glue in the space around these 3.5 millimeter cylinders to embed them within the teeth. And this is a case with the um, uh, the, the cylinders that are screwed onto the implants and, and, and these are hollow with screw access holes um, which is how the, the prosthesis is is uh, placed and removed and this is looking from above how um, we need some space around these just to in inject the dental glue to, to attach them and this is after we've done that and you can see the glue is a little bit of an off-white color but uh, you get the idea here. Uh, the other feature of this is that uh, this trumpet shaped area is divided into two parts. The smaller lower part closest to the implant, which is the green part here, is 1.5 millimeters tall. 
So since implants should be placed from one to two millimeters below the surface of the bone, this is an easy way to place the implant at the proper depth without having to measure. Uh, you can see what I mean in this video here, which I've sped up fast, where if we look at these uh, three implants placed in cross section in a fibula, you can see how that, that, that smaller part of the trumpet closest to the implant is a way to just verify the, the, the depth to make sure we're, uh, in this case, about 1.5 millimeters deep. Um, now, uh, when, when you're making the cutting guide or the, uh, uh, the fibula cutting guides with the implant holes, um, you know, these holes have to be, um, uh, they have to be tied into the proper dimensions uh, based on the dental implant system that the surgeon is using. So the, the standard industry, the industry standard dental implant guided systems, as far as I can tell, uh, is 0 0.2 millimeters of space around the key insert. So there has to be a slight space to allow the pieces to fit together and not bind up. And this also allows for the inherent accuracies of 3D printing at this fine level. So for the, the Nobel implant system I use, the outer diameter of the key is 5.0 millimeters. So this means the implant hole in the fibula cutting guide has to be 5.2 millimeters for this to seat. Um, a few other pearls. Uh, uh, the, the, the photo on the left shows how um, you know, do, we plan these so that the implants miss the screws that are um, going to be placed to hold the reconstruction plate in, pl in place. The middle photo shows three ideal features. Uh, number one, the fibula is low posteriorly, but is higher anteriorly to have 15, more, 15 millimeters of restorative space uniformly all the way across the fibula. Uh, number two, the plate is kept low on the fibula and away from the implant platforms. Uh, this minimizes exposure of the plate if the soft tissue is needed to be modified later. Uh, for an example, if, if, uh, you know, if an incision is made in the mouth to try to improve on the vestibule, if the plate gets exposed from that oral incision, they tend to get colonized and infected with the oral bacteria, and this can require the patient to go back to the hospital and have it removed. Um, Lastly, the, the screw holes are placed posterior to the dental implant positions. If an implant fails later and has to be removed, a new implant can be uh, placed in the adjacent bone without worrying about hitting a screw. Uh, lastly, on the far right, the, the way that implants uh, or, or the screws can be angulated, uh, uh, it, it creates a problem because uh, the plate is like the third side of a triangle and when you ha they never fit terribly accurately when you have a, a, a cuff of muscle there and so uh, I think it's much easier for screws just to be going uh, straight in. Uh, so uh, you know lastly if they want to make immediate teeth for a jaw in a day case you would send them the STL files uh, subject to your corporate guidelines. Uh, I suspect many of these cases will soon be done by your in-house teams, but the principles and requirements are the same, whether you're sending these to a dental lab or uh, the surgeon. And so the, uh, these four yellow bullet points are the, the four STL files you need to send to the either dental lab or the um, surgeon to make the, the, the teeth. And so I want to make a differentiation here between what we call the reconstructed model and the defect model. The reconstructed model we just discussed is really only useful for designing the dental prosthesis uh, virtually. In surgery, we need a defect model, which is a little different. Uh, don't include the fibula on the defect model because we will be placing the patient's fibula into that defect. We do need the predictive screw holes in the jaw model because we will uh, place the plate on the model to fixate the patient's fibula into position, which I'll show you um, an example of in a minute. Finally, since the defect will have the two remaining fibula segments separated, you need adequate supports to hold the segments together. Uh, we have seen some of these warp and sterile processing in hospitals that uh, don't have or refuse to use non-heat sterilization. Um, since, since most uh, tooth STL files uh, 
uh, are used for orthognathic splints, which are fairly thin, only the cusps of the teeth are merged with the CT scan data in those cases. There's a tendency to do the same here and only include the cusp tips. But for these fibula cases, we need the entire teeth, even a few millimeters of the gums. This gives us the ability to make a stent that wraps around the remaining natural teeth, which will suspend the dental prosthesis in the correct position. And we call this a floating prosthesis. Uh, the software we use uh, to make the teeth is Blue Sky Plan, which is a dental implant software, and another one called Mesh Mixer. And this is a free software um, it's actually an old software uh, made by uh, around 2007 um, and by Ryan Schmidt, who is a software developer who created this program while he was a PhD student in Canada studying computer graphics. More recently, he's moved to Epic Games, which is uh, Gears of War and Fortnite is where you would have heard of them from. So I thought it would be helpful to see an accelerated video of the downstream process of what we do with your SDL files to create the, the new teeth. And with this model, and the this is the Blue Sky Plan software, we're able to take the teeth and pour them up into a stone model digitally here. And we're gonna cut away everything we don't need. And what I mean by that is we're using the patient's preoperative teeth, we're just going to clone them to make this, this bridge in the implants. And so we're going to trim away these areas we don't need. The contact area um, uh, is it, something that we'll deal with in, in Mesh Mixer where it's, it's a little bit easier. And once we move this over to Mesh Mixer, uh, we do a Boolean subtraction or Boolean difference. And let me, uh, I'm going to pause this for a minute. So this is the reason for the six millimeter diameter uh, cylinders on the, on the VSB implant is because that, that determines where we're going to make holes in the prosthesis by, by doing this digital subtraction. Uh, if we want to make this floating prosthesis with a stent in the Blue Sky software, we... Um, uh, we just draw a circle around these teeth of where we want to make it and we put those window boxes in to cut a window so that we can see that it's seated and then we just create an arm uh, and we create some arms that extend out and will suspend this prosthesis in, in space and um, sometimes I get bored and I find ways to entertain myself with the arms attaching the, the teeth to the stent here like you can see. Uh, you know, we'll finish with some examples here of uh, the, the products in use. This is the mandible cutting guide on the left that's fixated to the mandible with the screws. And on the right, we have the, the drill that uh, is drilling the predictive screw holes. And so this is a, the fibula harvest where uh, we haven't made the bone cuts yet, but it, it shows how um, there's, there's muscle that remains attached to the leg because the blood supply comes through the, the, the muscle and so we have to retain some of that and at the bottom you can also see uh, uh, some blood vessels Th these are we call these perforators that are coming up to the skin uh, so that a, a, a paddle of skin can be taken and this is after we make the bone cuts we start to kind of pull the bone out out of the leg a little bit uh, and once the bone is harvested this is a cutting guide where we're drilling for dental implants and there's one of these keys in place. I always drill bicortical in these all the way through the backside. And that allows me to, to deepen the implant as, as much as we need to here. And so um, then we place the actual dental implants. And th th this is an implant going in. And there's there's ways to control the depth or, or at least measure the, the depth so that we're one to two millimeters subcrestful. And then we have the uh, saw where we're actually going to make the osteotomies in the uh, fibula to cut it up into pieces. So then we're still in the lag here. Um, for these cases, this is where the this is the defect model where that comes into play where we attach the plate to it and then we bring up the fibula to attach it um, and. It, it, this can really be like playing that old game Tetris where you're trying to make all these little segments fit into place and I use these drills uh, just to, to um, kind of loosely fixate these with but still has a lot of wiggle room where you can bring the other segments in and, and so um, 
this is where we start to bring in the, the teeth. These teeth are not attached to the implants. These teeth are sitting on this uh, floating prosthesis. This is the, that stent where um, uh, it's sitting on the remaining teeth on the opposite side. If we, if we look down from above, we can see we're, we're about where we should be because these implants are coming up through the holes here. And so then we, we inject our dental glue to attach the teeth. Uh, this is a, a, a dental resin where we um, uh, connect the teeth to these metal cylinders. The red straws are a way to make sure that this glue doesn't get down in those holes because those are the, the, the screw access holes, which makes this retrievable. You can, you can take this on and off. And these are just... Um, some examples here of uh, how we inject the glue. Then we then we have to go back and smooth them off um, and fill in the gaps. And uh, th this is a case at the um, at the end showing the occlusion uh, with the new teeth before we're before we tie the sutures and and, and close things up. Um, and the last case I have here, this is uh, uh, this floating prosthesis that um, we made here with 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 uh, some photos showing how you can look down the holes and see how the holes in the teeth align with the holes in the, the fibula underneath. Um, and again, implants here. And then we place these, uh, we call them temporary copings, these, these chimneys, which are the screw access. And then uh, placing the teeth over those, we're going to uh, do the pickup where we inject the resin or the glue and and you can see that here and the red straws keep it from getting down in the holes then we cut away all that stint and we go around and just polish and smooth this off so that then we're able to um, uh, place this in the mouth and we check our occlusion and um, uh, verify that things are good so that's all I have, and I hope this is helpful. Uh, feel free to reach out to me with any questions or suggestions. Thank you.